Awesome. Hi, everybody. Hello. Good afternoon. And if I may, bonjour. So welcome to the last day of KubeCon and to our session where we will talk about how I met your software. And uh, disclaimer, we are slightly inspired by how I met your mother and promise we won't take it too far. Uh, of course, I will thank you all first. This is such a lovely turnout for coming here after lunch. That too on the last day. We'll try to make it worth it. And we are excited to have the next 30 minutes of a lot of fun and interaction. Thanks, guys. Wait, 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 wait. Why is the software spelled as software like that? Well, AI, AI, AI. I think Yukon has talked a lot about AI. So don't mind. AI is still not taking your jobs. You are here to fix the spellings. <laughs> so, yeah, move ahead. So, I'm sorry if I'm going to call you all kids. You are certainly not kids. But kids, we are in the spring of 2024. And here we are going to embark on our journey of securing or securely consuming your software. And before we embark on our journey, let's briefly introduce about ourselves. Hi again. I am Anushka Mittal. I work with Nirmata. And I predominantly contribute to Kiverno. Hi, everyone. My name is Prithanjay, and I'm a software engineer at ChainGuard. And I've been contributing to projects like Wolfi and Kyverno. And other than that, you can also find me making some cappuccinos. Hi, everyone. I am Subhash Mehta. I work with Sivu as a research and development engineer. And I occasionally also contribute to Kubernetes. I'm part of the CI release and release, uh, Kubernetes release team. So I work with the CI signal team. Thank you. Let's move ahead. OK. So by a show of hands, how many of you think there's some difference there? Like jellyfish? Jellyfish. By a show of hands, of course. Oh, OK. So it's probably, th thank you. Do you think you can point out the difference? Wow. You are close, I mean, actually. You are close. Some but really, somewhat, somewhat but close, but not. Anyone else? That's Any guesses? Right. That's all right. OK. So I think now it's turn to reveal what's the difference here. So probably if you were in 2019 or 2020, and probably if you were in installing by just copy pasting a command, you might have installed a, wall, a malware uh, that has stealed your SS, SSH and GPG keys if you have installed the second one. Can you move to the next slide, please, and show what is the difference there? It's I. So, so these kind of typo squatting attacks have been quite common when you have been, if you consume projects, if you consume software directly through projects like PyPy. And PyPy has fixed it more than six times. I guess this was the sixth time when this was fixed. But it caused a lot of repercussions because Jellyfish was also used with DateUtil, with Py3 DateUtil, which is, again, a clone of original DateUtil. So these, uh, both the packages actually worked quite the same because they were just copy-paste. But the second one was actually stealing your GPG and SSH keys. Now, since we have set the stage, uh, you guys love stories, right? And since we are, our theme is also based on a sitcom, I'll probably share with you one story. I, I love Christmas, OK? And I love Christmas surprises. So let me walk you through a story, right? What happened uh, on December 25th of 2022, when everyone was busy enjoying their Christmas parties, something uh, a traditional, or you can say a legendary incident happened. Right? So a package, if you know PyTorch, PyTorch also has a dependency called Torch Triton. What happened was the Torch Triton, a malicious package disguised as Torch Triton, was included in the PyPy. Anyone who installed Torch Triton via pip, just pip install that Torch Triton, it actually installed the malicious package. How did it happen? So PyPy has this open precedence when anybody can upload a package with a similar name. And PyPy is designed predominantly to use the first version or the latest version by default. So the latest package, the malicious package that got uploaded to the repository of PyPy, it got installed to users' computers by default. 
I mean, it looks the same, it spells the same, but it is a malicious binary. It could include, it includes your, um, it could read your passwords, it could read your SSH keys, it could also like read your git configs, and it also had the ability to package all of that stuff into a file and upload it to an unsecure website. That is so, so scary, right? I mean, that's not a bad Christmas surprise, but it was for the hacker, of course, but it was a nightmare for other developers who have, they have uh, broken, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They, they broke their own security, they, they breached it, and they are doomed now. What should they do now? They are surprised, they were surprised, how do, how do they handle it? How did they handle it? Yeah, so, uh, you know, that was really a horror story. Uh, glad I was just graduating back then. So, all right, you know, um, let me put some numbers as well. This malicious software was out there for five days, available to be downloaded and used. I think by the end, more than 2,300 downloads were done of this said malicious software. And given what it could do, that could have been crazy. So, how did PyTorch sort of, you know, help with uh, resolving it? So. They, of course, renamed the package internally. The second thing, they deleted any dependent packages, any dependent on Torchitron packages. They also reached out to the PyPy security team to get proper ownership of uh, the Torchitron package, and they you know, deleted the malicious one. Finally, they did provide some support to find out if you were affected or not and what you could do. But really, this is something that happened two years ago in 2022, and um, this is just one of the many attacks that we've seen. This we've used to really set some context and understand and remind you how important security can be. Getting secure software, keeping your workloads secure, and how important it is to really have a robust and secure supply chain. So that, that was a little bit serious. Now we have a friend. Our friend is Ted, and this is not Ted. Ted is somewhere, somewhere. So Ted is a determined guy who wanted to find the one, the one right software, secure for him, that made him feel safe. So let's see his journey. Okay, before, before going to see his journey, I will like to introduce you, like what my idea is of consuming software, right? There are multiple options. What do we choose? Do we go via distributions like Wolfie or Alpine or Debian, or do we do via projects like PyPy and Go like we discussed, right? Let's walk through. So if I choose distribution first, we get the prepackaged installation. That's great. We get to hand handle it, and we get great user experience, and we can tailor it for our use case, right? But then that compromises the user system it will give right direct access to your system. But if we uh, consume it via a customized project, what will happen then? I mean, it's great, you can tailor make it for your own use case, but still you open doors for compromising your own system. Okay, let's see, maybe via configured project that's already there, people are maintaining it. We can trust people, right? We can trust maintainers, they are great, they're doing great jobs. What will happen then? It goes into the supply chain, software supply chain, right? And just as we discussed before, this PyTorch incident, anyone who wants, with not good as intentions as we have, sharing with the insights with you here, can push the package to that software supply chain, right? And it will intentionally break it and make it malicious. It directly goes to your user system and it compromises it. I mean, we have so many options, but none of these seem to work right. What should we do now? What should we do? What should Ted do? Thank you so much, Vashmeta and Anushka, for setting the stage. But now, our friend Ted has been traumatized. And this trauma is leading him to a lot of retrospect and a lot of thinking. Like, what should he do next? Yeah, I mean, should he go for secure software? Would that probably be latest software? 
or probably he should look into more distribution or packages that are available. I don't know. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Let me take ahead the lead from here and tell you what this dilemma can lead to and how we can actually solve it. Enough of talking about the problem. Now let's talk about what are the solutions and what are the pathways. So developers often face a dilemma that, hey, whether I should consume a project via distribution or whether I should consume directly from uh, PyPy or NPM, and especially with node packages, that what, that what we are going to discuss next. So before I move ahead, let me ask a couple of questions to our guests. So Subhash Mehta, have you ever consumed like Python, uh, a Python project? And if you have consumed, what has been experienced, whether you have you used PyPy or Anaconda? I mean, well, I can share my insights, the pros and cons for Anaconda, consuming it via Anaconda or by PyPy. And you guys are smart. You can decide then. Okay, so Anaconda offers a set of predominant or predefined uh, packages that are there and the curation uh, is maintained by the Anaconda team and it has reduced the risk of installing malicious or poorly maintained packages, right? The another advantage of Anaconda is Anaconda maintains uh, isolation a package environment where you reduce the risk of dependency, like mismatch dependency conflicts. Um, and you get really uh, like the latest software, not unintended software. Additional security in Anaconda includes something like packet signing, checksum verifications, and it ensures the package integrity, right? On the other hand, PyPy has this open feature and it holds a vast number of uh, Python packages. So in terms of variety, you can look into PyPy, but in terms of uh, like very, very secure software that you don't want to compromise on, Anaconda would be a better choice. So PyPy's open nature would allow anyone to upload packages as we discussed before, right? But however, PyPy also has mechanisms input to like reduce the risks that we have at hand. That is we are here to discussing, to discuss all of this stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much, Subhash Mehta. My next question goes to Anushka. So now that we have answer over Python packages, the more interesting one comes with how do you deal with Node? How do you install Node-based things on your system? I would probably use NPM, the Node Packet Man Package Manager, to you know get different packages and maintain its dependencies. And I think that's the only one I've used before. Yeah, I mean, that is one of the things that we have often faced is that while Python still has Anaconda, uh, when it comes to node-based applications, we usually prefer NPM. And again, that comes with the problem of making, of pushing anything that you want. And again, if it's not audited and if it's not checked properly, you might be consuming malware. There are distributions that have come up which are trying to solve even for this. And, and one of them is like Wolfi, where you can even install NPM packages and in fact, uh, what I'm going to talk about next is uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of comparison between different distributions that we have, and each distribution has its own benefits, advantages, and disadvantages. But one of the tussle that we often see is uh, is glibc versus muscle. I mean, not this muscle, of course, but uh, but the standard library of C. So let's let's talk about uh, whenever we are building images or whenever we are building software, we often end up using. Alpine as base layer, or we often use Debian, or we or sometimes we use other options like Wolfi, which are new. So Alpine is often one of the most commonly used because it offers minimal, you know, con minimal con container configuration, it's more secure, but it comes at the cost of using MUSL. And what happens when you use MUSL is that DNS is always the issue. So uh, it probably is one of the most common problems of using MUSL is that it it, it, it does not, by design, allow DNS and, uh, and prefers it over uh, and, is, and it is not preferred there. And that has led to issues like, especially if, if, it, if, if you are building an application, it runs fine on your local machine. But it is, it, is, it is very much possible that when you run that inside Kubernetes clusters, you might face and hit that error again. Now, what happens when, when you deal with such issues? It, it, it becomes problematic. While Alpine is great, it is very much important that in such cases where you are stuck, you have an alternative for yourself to actually consider. And Wolfie is actually an undistro. I mean, uh, undistro calling something undistro is quite 
contradictory or quite an ironical nature to say that, but it is, it is because Wolfi does not have a Linux kernel itself. It operates and it uses your own container, it's, uh, it, it uses your own host, and it's basically a containerized Linux environment that ultimately makes you run your, uh, uh, basically install your packages that you need. And it's, it's very much Alpine based. It's not something that you might have to do differently. It's all APK add that you might have to do. But that is a tussle that we often see and, and we wanted to discuss that when we are talking about different distributions. Because as we discussed through Subhash Mehta and Anushka, we often complain, what should we, what should we do? I think ultimately developers should build and distribution should distribute in simple words. And, and that is where ultimately a uh, Unix-based distribution is simply a tar.dz tar file. And, and if we make it as simple as for the end users to consume via distributions, what it offers better is more reliability, more security, because dedicated volunteering and maintenance are there for, for different distributions, whether it is Debian, whether it is Alpine, whether it is Fedora, whether it is Wolfie. And, and one of the problems that developers often face is that, hey, they are not going with the latest software. They are still stuck on something else. They are not following the speed. And that is what limits them to sometimes consume the projects directly. And that is what sometimes uh, makes a problem for them. But that is also being solved with, uh, with, with things uh, like Debian recently. And in fact, uh, Wolfie. Uh, Wolfie has a specific GitHub action bot for that, which always checks that whenever the latest update comes, how we make sure that it is always up to date, the software that is patched and is latest up to date. Coming next, I think our friend Ted is still looking for red flags, right? He's a determined guy. He needs to be sure. So, so yeah. I think it's time that probably we show you some example of pulling a public upstream image from a project directly like SQL pad and how if we try to uh, scan its CVs with some distribution and how, what, is, what difference does it make? So probably let me begin by doing that. So let's start with, so SQL pad is a web-based editor. I hope the screen is visible and uh, for SQL pad. And now I'm going to do a simple gripe check. Gripe is a scanner for checking the CVEs. And uh, I'm going to pull its public image and I'm going to compare with a Wolfie, a Wolfie based package of the same. So it's Please bear with us. So if we just look at it, there are around 90 vulnerabilities, and some of them are coming from NPM, some of them are Debian-based. Uh, but yeah, one of them is critical, that's coming from Debian. And that is where the part that we were discussing comes into picture. Now let's compare it with something when we talk about a distribution. So this is a Wolfie distribution that I have been running locally. And if I do APK add, So it's already installed for me because the internet was causing a problem, so I already installed it. But let me try and do a gripe scan on this package. No vulnerabilities found. I think Ted can now be a little bit convinced. Let's move to the slides of what he might be going to choose. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Ted was realizing his patterns, he saw that he could probably, you know, make a final decision. So Ted was happy he found the one. Awesome. So that was pretty much like the second part of our session. Let's move on to the last part. And what's more? You know, you've been around for three days. You've probably seen multiple solutions out there, multiple things that people are doing for security in general, overall. So let me just talk about a few. I might, of course, miss some, sorry. But, all right, so the first thing that Mrityanjaya just demoed was, you know, embracing distroless distributions. So this will sort of, you know, just like Wolfie, it helps you get container images that are more in tune with the requirements of modern supply chain security. 
next being you know using signing and co you know using cosign or notary or projects to sign your images so i'm a developer i've built something i've made an image i want to sign it because at that time i knew that this was safe and secure so the next person using this image verifying this image can be sure that this is safe right so that's using signing software the next would be to use a policy engine so you have your workloads running you have everything in place let's have policy engines let's have admission controllers that make sure uh, you know no request is a bad request there's no bad configuration examples of policy engines of course include kiverno opa gatekeeper what these will essentially help you do is validate all your requests coming in your workload and make sure they are compliant of course just FYI, because I'm involved there, uh, Kiberno, traditionally known to be Kubernetes native, can actually now be used across cloud to scan for misconfigurations. All right, so um, you can, of course, you know, enhance container security using tools like Falco. They are uh, Falco is a threat detection engine. Uh, you should and probably um, you know need to look into zero trust networking where nobody is trusted by default. Um, there's, of course, embracing DevSecOps practices, and this should be in all stages. You, in the commit stage, in the build, deploy, and run. You need to have practices, DevSecOps practices in all these stages. And um, yeah, of course, there's, uh, you know, you want to utilize service mesh. Uh, I don't know why that looks so It's weird. a mesh. Mess, actually. <laughs> yeah, so this mesh technology is like Istio or Linker to have, you know, proper service-to-service -service communication security there. And, you know, this line really concludes everything for me. You need to, need to have robust, strengthened, secure supply chains, and you need to be able to depend on them to make sure nothing bad's happening. Like we have discussed this on general terms. These are like also depend on what things you want, what are your priorities. So those can be boiled down to those aspects as well, how you are going to consume that on a lower level or a higher level. It also depends on what priorities you have, what advantages you want to look into. That all depends on the user use case, right? We are discussing it on a general basis. Yeah, definitely. Moving over, I think we ran it quick. Uh, we are short of slides, but we did share. No, I mean, it was a quick journey. Thank you. And that's, kids, how I met your software. That's us. Thank you, folks. And uh, you. we'll. Uh... So, if you wish to connect with us, uh, these are QR codes. So, yeah. we would love to be connected with you and discuss more about any feedback related to talk anything that we can improve. And thank you so and much for And just to talk, of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah, this is probably the coolest slide. It has QR codes. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. All right, I think we have a decent amount of time oh. to take some questions if there are any. Move to the side. Okay, and I do realize it's the last day, just after lunch. You might just want to, you know, get some free time, get a nap or something. But yeah, we are around if you want to chat. And discuss more about this topic. Yeah, we'd yeah. love to. So I guess, I guess that's a wrap. Thank you, folks. Thank you for coming.